All right, hey, welcome to Deal Makers. This is Sean Katona, uh, commercial real estate investor and landlord. Today, I am joined by the one and only Emily Curry, office commercial real estate broker extraordinaire. Uh, and I don't know a whole lot about office. So Emily, I'm really excited to tap into your expertise. Uh, today, we have a lot to cover, market trends, what's happening in the office category, opportunities, factors impacting deals. And Emily, I'm hoping that you're gonna go through a couple transactions that you're working on either right now or recently so we can kind of learn what's happening in real time and kind of pick up on some of these trades. I think it's just, it's one thing to read about commercial real estate in the media. It's a whole nother thing to hear about, you know, actual deals in progress from the people that are doing them week in and week out. So thank you for joining. Welcome to the program. How are you doing? Good, how are you, Sean? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. I understand it's a little warm out in Phoenix right now. It's a little warm, yes. We're trying to stay cool out here, but I'm so excited to be on this with you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking about it for a few weeks now. So let's yeah. start with a quick kind of intro for anyone who doesn't know you. Can you just give us a background on, you know, what your specialty is, um, what you're focused on these days, your bread and butter, or or maybe that's even your unique ability in this commercial real estate space? Sure. So uh, I'm Emily Curry with Colliers. I've been in the industry for about 15 years, um, a broker for about seven of those. I've worked for uh, several of the top real estate firms. Um, and right now I focus on office flex and healthcare properties. Um, and I've done that primarily for the last seven years as a broker. So I love the office market. It's obviously been challenging, had lots of challenges last year. Um, but Phoenix at least is rebounding. We've seen a lot more activity this year and um, and so I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah, and, and maybe that's a great place to start if you can kind of bring everyone up to speed. So it's like, uh, office and pandemic, and you yeah. think about those two <laughs> words together and people lose their mind because we've all been you know, working from home for over a year and oh. aren't half of all office buildings vacant right now? Like, you know, I, I think <laughs> right. that's probably the perception out there. I know I've been a little skittish and interested in the category. So I think b bring us up to speed because you're, you're day in and day out versus the headlines. Sure. I know. Uh, and I know the headlines can certainly highlight maybe some of the worst parts of it right now. And I will say office is not dead. It certainly had its challenges, but it's not dead. So last year we saw, I mean, even through April, there was about 4 million square feet um, uh, sublease space that came available. So that was, you know, one of the largest numbers we've seen. Um, but I will say we've heard a lot of companies are going back. Several of those have been taken off. Some of them have been subleased. So those are the kind of stories you don't necessarily hear about them being backfilled or companies coming back. Um, I think companies as a whole are kind of reassessing, obviously, how they're going to office moving forward. Yep. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, some people want to want the convenience of working from home. Some want to go into an office. Um, I've heard some of them are going to base it on performance. So if you're hitting your numbers, you can, you know, work a couple days from home. If you're not, you need to be in the office. I think we're getting back to kind of business as usual in that regard. Yeah. Um, so it's exciting to see these companies coming back. We've heard kind of after Labor Day is going to be the day we come back. Arizona's obviously had, um, you know, maybe a more relaxed or we've, you know, kind of you know, gone without masks before a lot of the other states. So that's helped us. We've opened up our businesses a little faster. Um, and we've seen a huge influx of residents coming here who, you know, were in states that couldn't operate. And so they moved their headquarters or their companies here, which has been happening, you know, all, all throughout the years, but has accelerated a little bit. And it yeah. certainly accelerated some of the trends in the office market. So... So I, I heard kind of two schools of thought. It was, hey, are people physically going to need to space out more in an office and will we need more space? Right. Or are people going to work from home, uh, some of the workforce, and we need less space? Like, do you end up being kind of right where you were? And what what seems to be also kind of trending is, hey, I'll work from home two or three days a week, but I'm going to come in to do my meetings and meeting spaces are maybe more coveted, like, What's what's your vibe on that? Because there's this like whole enterprise world of like mega offices, but then you know there's probably small and medium businesses that make up the majority of inventory. Or keep me honest on that. What do you, what do you think? I mean, I I haven't really heard a lot of. I think initially there was that thought of maybe having bigger cubes or having more space to move around. There are certainly some companies that are moving towards that, but I also think some of them have been uh, innovative and in just putting up. You know, they have the dividers now that are pretty. Um, 
readily available for people who want to have some division and some privacy, I guess, from other cubes. And then I'm actually seeing a lot of people that are planning like almost like a hoteling, like just a station where, you know, you might have five employees, but you only have two or three desks because they're going to be rotating while they work from home and coming in. So it's almost the opposite a little bit where they can maybe fit efficiently in a smaller footprint, not need as, as large of a space, but still provide a space where they can come in and work, but they don't need like a dedicated desk or a huge cube. So it kind of runs the gamut, just depends on the company and obviously you know, the use and how they handle it. But um, I'm seeing more of that than I am needing more space for the distancing. Is there going to be a ton of vacancy for a while? Or does this get converted? Does it does it get absorbed just over, you know, organic growth for years to come? How do you think this plays out? I still think, uh, you know, even over the next year, we're going to see companies continue to downsize vacate their large floor plates. I still think there's law firms in large space that they're going to give back at least some space or relocate to a smaller suite. Um, That's been happening anyways, just because, you know, the law firms have been downsizing and found more efficient uh, floor plans for their Mm -hmm. use. But, um, you know, I think that's going to happen everywhere. So I don't think we've seen the end of this, but I still think, you know, deals are being made. People are finally making decisions. That was one of the biggest challenges with 2020 was that, the uncertainty, nobody wanted to make a decision. So it was kicking the can down the road to see, you know, how it's going to play out or what they need to do as all the protocols continue to change. Um, now we're finally seeing kind of light at the end of the tunnel and decision makers actually making decisions on their space. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, so let's, let's then think about someone like me selfishly, <laughs> right? Uh, I would consider myself kind of an opportunistic investor. You know, I like going in and finding problems that I can solve. Sure. Uh, if it's a half vacant building, leasing that up, forcing appreciation into the property and potentially doubling the value of it. So now you got me salivating, you know, are there, are there going to be some opportunities like that because of this, maybe more so in office than any other category. I don't know. Retail kind of got battered, but it seems to be doing better than I ever thought it would have. You hear a lot about hotels and certainly offices right up there in that conversation. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, can we, can we find something to buy? I certainly think there is uh, definitely opportunities out there. And I think, you know, looking for those value add properties is important. Our biggest challenge right now with leasing has been tenant improvements. And I'm sure that's been a challenge across every asset type, just because the cost of construction and labor is just going up. So every, every lease deal you do, you know, has just been more challenging than ever. And I think that plays into it. So certainly, um, you know, some of the larger landlords I work with that have maybe um, a larger staff or somebody who can handle that might be able to, you know, buy a building with some value add and efficiently, you know, create better spaces that could be leased than maybe the current landlord. Um, And I think that's kind of happening everywhere. So there's certainly opportunities. I've also seen a lot of adaptive reuse, especially in medical. So, you know, some of these surgery centers or, you know, medical clinics are going into, you know, old freestanding Walgreens or things like that. So that's been, you know, there, that's almost like that med tail where it's, you know, maybe kind of office it's medical, but it's going into retail, which has been a, a much bigger trend as you know. So I like that. I hadn't heard that term before. Med, so okay. that's an office type use retail or medical user going into a retail space. Mm-hmm. Okay, I dig it. And I like that user because they tend to, you know, want a nice TI package. I can bump the rents. My net operating income goes up. The value of my building goes up. That's sure. that's a win. Um, is it possible to give a rule of thumb on TI right now? Or is that just so all across the board? Like allowances that people want to see or are expecting. It's tough. And I think what, what we've heard is, you know, if on the landlord side, if you're going to do anything to get ready for these tenants, maybe coming to the market here in the next year that maybe haven't made decisions before it's get it ready now. So we've been very successful um, with like, for instance, my property on the West in the West Valley, it was a complete redevelopment. They gutted it, started over, did spec suites that were all under a thousand square feet. And we're, I have two leases out, we're 92% leased. And that's in less than a year to do that. Now that's not really, I mean, at that point, you're not really factoring in the TI because you're just leasing the space as is, and you just want to get the deals done and get the space leased up. But typically in the past, you know, carpet and paint was maybe 10 bucks and now it's 20 to 30. I mean, even some of the deals I've done with just a basic demo 
maybe paint and, um, you know, flooring and it's 30 bucks a foot. So that's just to start. And I'm hearing some of the office TIs go, you know, almost to a more, if you want like office build out a basic ones, 50 to 60 bucks. So it's increased significantly. It's like my, my, mentality is not keeping up with the inflation <laughs> it's like <Right. laughs> the labor's going up the materials are going up like right. I, I don't know if our lease rates are keeping up or uh what i had to talk to a couple brokers about recently was the rent bumps like three huh? percent has been the norm forever right or maybe a huh? shrewd you know tenant gets two percent but like we're going to start putting four and five percent rent bumps is that keeping in line with inflation now what is cpi bumped up to like 4.2 the other day it's just kind of crazy it is. And I know that's part of it. They talked about all along as well. The rates haven't moved and the rates have stayed steady, but you have to keep the rates where they're at. If you're going to spend that much more in the tenant improvements, what was before a low and you almost have to bump them, which is kind of counterintuitive to what the market was doing before, where not many people were leasing space. You'd think, do we need to lower the rent? But you almost can't if it needs an improvement because the improvements are so much. Can can you uh, expand a little bit on where you're seeing the most demand right now? Like, is there, you mentioned medical as an example, but is there a category of office users or a subset or a specialty where you're just like, look, this is the absolute favorite of everybody right now. They want to be in this part of town or in this type of product where I could, I could, you know, seek out something that's in demand versus trying to create it. Sure. Um, I would say, I guess, overall, Um, And I tend to deal in kind of that class B office market. Um, Overall, anything that's under, I would say like 2000 square feet is what's getting leased really anywhere and getting leased quickly. And they're the types too, like I've talked about with the spec suites that are making decisions quickly. They don't necessarily, I don't want to say they don't comprehend a TI, but they don't leave room for a build out. So they want to find things that are ready. So like I said, my my project in the West Valley, we leased that very quickly because they were ready to go. They could see it. They liked it and and we could move forward. Same in the East Valley though. I have a property in Chandler and I think I did five leases in three months and they were all under around thousand square feet, I should say. So yeah. um, I think that's been where there's been a lot of movement. Certainly larger tenants are in the market, but that's where I'm seeing it happen very quickly and, and getting deals done. So if you've got a big space um, or like we could even say there's a big re- like a big retail box or something like that, or maybe it's a good fit for office or maybe it's a big office plate, um, mm-hmm. you would on spec spend the money to demise it and make it smaller so it leases up quicker. What are, what are your thoughts there? Absolutely. So I'm actually at my West Valley property now. I just walked with the landlord and we just looked at breaking up a a whole floor plate that's about 28,000 square feet into about 10 spec suites that are roughly 2,000, you know, to 3,500 square feet. And we were initially saving that for a large user, but given the the tenants in the market and the success we've had with the the smaller suites, we just walked that space to see, you know, how the smaller suites would fit in there. Unfortunately, um, that's the way it's going <laughs> for some properties. Yeah. I know. It, is there um, some best practices that you might want everyone to be thinking about? It's like, hey, if you've got this size floor plate, like do these things. It makes a lot of sense and seems to work well, or maybe stay away from these because it's just so cost prohibitive. You, know, you don't want to go down that path. Um, I Maybe would that's an say, ar- architect question. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I will say um, specifically with this landlord that I've worked with, I think he's done a great job with his architect to kind of line up the floor plan and the the spaces in in our other building. Basically, all the the offices line the windows, and they could be uh, divided in half or opened up, and it's easy. It all has like one line, so it's very easy to create a 2000 square foot space or two 1000 square foot spaces. So I think that flexibility is important. And that's definitely what I look at if they're going to go redo a space is having that because you don't want to have to later, you know, redo it again. And it just makes it easier to do lease deals if you have varying sizes. You got my gears turning here. I'm wondering, <laughs> is, is there any sort of good tech or materials now where you can do more modular setups that still work that create maybe the soundproofing that people need, but you're not going in and necessarily doing, you know, drywall and electrical and plumbing and all that is, is there like a hybrid? There is, I know of a couple companies, but um, one of 
the groups that was actually in one of our buildings is Interior Avenue, and they do basically glass modular so you can create offices that you can just come in. And then it's also movable, right? So if in the future you want to open the space back up, it's not drywall that you're demoing. You just kind of break apart this modular piece and you have open space again. So I was really impressed with their um, product. I know there's others out there. I think even Goodman's um, and Vari make some of the modular pieces, maybe not full offices, but that could be moved um, like that. So we should put links to that in the yeah. description for this video, just because I think personally that's interesting and I, I'm sure other folks will find that to be a valuable resource. Okay, so Absolutely. let's do a little bit more education. You know, okay. if someone doesn't have a clue about, you know, buying an office building as an investment or mm -hmm. leasing it as a tenant, like uh, maybe bring us up to speed on some of the factors uh, to think about or that, that impact the office market. And you might have touched on that a little bit earlier, but you know, uh, one-on-one me, if you will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm finding that the biggest piece of information that I think is important to me and, and being a local broker is really knowing your market. Um, I think that's helped me compete with lease deals. That's helped. I mean, it helps with the investment side. It helps with the leasing side. So knowing your market, knowing what you're competing with. Um, in the past, I've done a lot in the, you know, CBD and that has one of our highest vacancy levels right now, as you can imagine, because it has most of our towers just knowing kind of what you're competing with, obviously having an understanding of con the construction and TI costs, that's huge. Um, because if you're not necessarily in this market or building out space, that can, um, I think, be shocking to most people. Right. Um, and then, you know, obviously your your income is a huge factor when you're looking at a building. Or, I mean, like I said, if it's, if it's more of a vacant building, there's a lot of um, owner users out there looking for space. I think there's a lot of adaptive reuse going on where, you know, maybe you see an office building, but it could be a flex building. I just walked a space that was like that. I said, why wouldn't you make it flex? Flex is a really hot market right now. So just having that eye to maybe be able to, you know, uh, convert it to something else if it's not office or or whatever it's, you know, currently in. Yeah, I think we're we're experiencing similar things in the retail category, right? It's like big boxes of the 80s uh, way back off the main drag aren't mm -hmm. in nearly as much demand as they once were. And so we're, we're repurposing, you know, good real estate, but for what, yeah. what users and tenants want for today. So that's, that's really sharp. I love I love that you can kind of dance between those different users, right? Medical flex office and think, you know, what's the highest and best use for this property at this point, you know, with where we're at and, and, you know, whether you want to call it the cycle or the evolution of business and what people and users and consumers all want today. So that's sure. very smart of you. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to go through any, you know, fun transactions? This is deal makers, things that you've either finished up recently or, or trades that you think are noteworthy, or if there's anything that you want to plug out there, you're looking for space, you're looking for users, you know, you're looking for certain tenants, uh, I'll give you the floor. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. I think, um, you know, a couple of the fun transactions we've done lately have been um, in the warehouse district. I worked with the team on that and there really haven't been a lot of, I guess, lease transactions down there. So we've uh, we worked with the, the local landlord who was trying to lease it himself and we took over and we've been able to almost fill his building already, you know, through this pandemic, but it's to really neat uses that are complementary to each other. So it's been really neat to see that evolve. It's an old, you know, historic building, red brick downtown. So it's just a really neat project to work on. So we've leased about, um, I guess we have 5,400 square feet left. So we've leased almost 20,000 square feet you know, just through that. So that's been neat, even through the pandemic that's happened. So that's great. And then uh, I was part of a sale for like a little historic building in Mesa and that was neat. It was an old women's club and it was just neat to go through the process on a truly, you know, registered historic building. We had 13 offers um, and it was just, it was just neat to talk to everybody. Everybody, you know, had such passion about the building, which you don't necessarily see in just a generic office building. So that was kind of a fun one to work on as well. Love it, love it. Um, I'm also always fascinated to hear about people's personal favorite investment that, that you would make right now. So if you were going to invest in a commercial real estate deal with your own money uh, yep. and, you know, maybe maybe that's writing a seven figure check to do your own deal. Or it could be, you know, a six figure check where you're partnering up with, you know, friends and you're, and you're syndicating a deal or you're joint venturing. Um, 
what would you go by? Where, where would it be? What would it look like? Kind of describe your ideal deal um, so that I could learn a thing or two. I think if it were me, I would look for uh, either like a flex building or even an office building that's exterior loaded. I think that's been a big selling point to have um, because many people have been leery to go back into the you know big tall buildings with elevators. So they like the exterior and they typically stay pretty well leased. Mm-hmm. Um, and then medical, I think medical has been a very strong asset through even the pandemic, obviously. And I think it, you know, continues to grow and remain a, a good prospect for investors. I like it. And then is there a deal size that you think is a sweet spot? I mean, that might be someone's personal capacity, but I think about, you know, do I get a little bit bigger than a mom and pop investor, but I don't necessarily want to compete with institutional capital, Is there a sweet spot in there that's maybe not quite as competitive or picked over? I think a sweet spot could even be if you're if you're getting into it and maybe newer to it. I think one of the sweet spots could be um, like a medical office condo, which is usually exterior loaded. A lot of the newer ones are freestanding buildings that are condos and a lot of them are occupied by medical tenants. So maybe you're in the 6000 square foot range, uh, maybe under 10,000 square feet, but you have you know, a a good tenant, typically a longer lease term with a medical deal. Um, So something like that would be a good, I guess, starting point Mm -hmm. if you didn't want to compete with like a large medical office. And the ideal suite size of that 10,000 foot building would be about a thousand feet or is there like a, a configuration, like small, medium, large or a mix? So a lot of the, I'm trying to think, a lot of the condos like that are typically fully occupied by the practice. Um, you might have two tenants. So if it is 10,000 square feet, you might have two 5,000 square foot tenants. Um, but a lot, they're not, the condos usually aren't too divided up, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say, you know, maybe having the smaller spaces, if you had maybe a larger building over 10,000 square feet again, and you had, uh, separate suites, probably having some smaller ones might help, um, one with the releasing, and just with your rent roll so that you're not, you know, one tenant doesn't vacate the whole building at once. You have some other tenants helping to supplement that. I'll just, maybe I'll, I'll dial it in a different way. So sure. let's say it's freestanding office, mm-hmm. 10,000 feet. Yep. Would you ideally have 10, 1,000 foot boxes? So you've got that diversity on the rent roll And that seems to be, you know, the size that's most in demand. What would you say? Yeah, I think especially in today's market, I think that would be helpful to have those smaller spaces. I guess the challenge with the small spaces, though, is that there is a lot of turnover. So a lot of the deals we're doing are on shorter lease terms. So you're just the turnover is is higher. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have a larger block, you're just it's a longer lease. So I guess it just depends on what your appetite is for your investment. And if you, you know, again, it's turning over space. So that comes at a cost too. Interesting. That makes me think I want to mix like yeah. you know, one or <laughs> yeah. two bigger tenants, like an anchor, and then sure. you kind of got the smaller ones. And you know, if a couple of these go out or these guys go under, you're not completely vacant, but you've got a diversification of that rent roll. Right. And I will say like for my West Valley project, it's a million square feet. It's 20 buildings and half of it's actually like 80% of it's industrials and it's fully leased. So you do have some supplement there where we're doing small office suites. So it's a little different because they're still getting income, even though they're small spaces. So if you had a freestanding building, you might not want them to be divided as much. But um, again, that's kind of where the tenants are that I see in the market today. Okay, let's talk about you a little bit more. I'd love, uh, and I think we've covered a lot of this already, but if, if you were to say, hey, you know, the reasons that my tenants choose me or my landlords choose me or my investors choose me, it's because, you know, I do these one or two or three things, you know, better than almost every other broker in town. You know, what would you say? This is your chance to be a uh, braggadocious. <laughs> I definitely think I'm a hard worker. I think that, I think I can... Uh... I've had, you know, people joke about my emails going out at 2 a.m. I mean, I have three kids, so I'm up at all hours of the night. They're getting a little older, so it's not as bad now. But I mean, I was literally sending out emails in the delivery room, like delivering. So, I mean, I definitely work hard. I, I can definitely say that. And I think my clients would say the same. I see the, the transaction through and I don't just leave them at that point. Like they know they can always reach out to me and I'll help them. So I think that's important to service clients that way. 
I love it. Would you, would you spend a minute just kind of explaining the process that you go through to um, either build your, your pipeline of tenants, um, mm-hmm. but also to fill a vacancy. If you take on a new listing, I know there's, there's probably a lot of things that happen that you do on behalf of a landlord. Sure. Or similarly, like kind of on the flip side of that is, you know, what, what keeps, you know, tenants coming back to you? Because you do both landlord and tenant. Yes. Right. So you've got tenants calling in going, hey, find me space. And you want to have a, a pipe, a steady stream of tenants continuing to come to you. But the mm-hmm. same with landlords. So you can actually speak to both of those worlds. And they're probably a little bit different. But, you know, I think about the marketing and the deal flow and, you know, the numbers and the, all the things that you can do to, to make people aware that great space is available mm-hmm. and to find a lot of tenants. So sure. Take it away. I will say uh, the Collier's marketing team is amazing. So they definitely help with that. One of the, I guess, newer things I've been doing, uh, again, going back to my West Valley property is we've had, we've used realty ads and done uh, social media marketing. And I will say um, one of, I think the best success stories was, you know, I post on Instagram on Monday and I had a lease signed by Wednesday and they literally referenced my Instagram post. So I think (laughs) that is a really, I think that's neat. And that's been newer than the, you know, I think in the past, the traditional way I've leased space. So I've tried to focus on that a little more. Um, And certainly being in the industry for as long as I have, I think, you know, a lot of it now is referral, repeat business, reaching out to clients that I've worked with, you know, they're referring to other people. I think, having the, you know, track record or the success I've had at some of the buildings also helps because, you know, my landlords are referring me to other people. So I think being where I'm at now, it's a little more um, referral based. And then again, branching out kind of in that social media piece. And again, working with, um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm by myself at Collier's, but I also work with teams. So I get to team up with the people for different, you know, asset types. So I like that. So I have a team I work with on an office, a team I work with on industrial and a team I work with on medical. So I've, I've enjoyed that too, because I can work on some deals with each one of them and it, it really helps me, you know, get a good, yeah. Feel yeah, for all I was that. just thinking tap into that larger, like monster resource that is the, right. the, the Collier's global network. So that's, Absolutely special. And then kind of final question for you, for anyone tuning in, you know, whether they're a tenant or a landlord or like who should be coming to you and for what, like a, a, an ideal client for you? That's a great question. So, and I've actually, I have a lot of friends who are in residential and they say they come across these, you know, commercial leads and they don't even know what to do with them. I think a lot of people, if you're not maybe a decision maker, don't necessarily know what we do, but I mean, absolutely. I think you should be talking to a broker, I guess, with any questions you have about your space, especially in this uh, world we live in now, right? So, I mean, there's a lot going on with relocations and downsizing and renewals and just so many different ways to structure a deal. I think it's really important to, you know, reach out to me or, or another broker to get guidance on that because, you know... I I don't do, if you have to go to the doctor, they're the specialist, like we're the specialist in real estate. You know, I'm not going to go give myself stitches. You should absolutely reach out to a professional to do that. And you should reach out to a professional who's in the market. I go back to that market knowledge piece where it's, you know, you really need to know the market because if you don't, you don't know if you're getting a good deal or not. Um, And that's just my opinion. And likewise with the landlord, again, I referenced our, our property in the warehouse district, they tried to self lease, but they don't necessarily know the brokerage community or how to get the message out. And we were able to broadcast it to, you know, brokers and tenants and and everybody. And we were able to land some deals and structure them in a way that benefited the landlord. So I just think having a broker on your side, even if it's just for questions, you know, maybe you're not ready to do a deal yet, but just for questions, I think makes a lot of sense. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I think I've, I've started to think of my, my broker uh, teams as, you know, more advisors and partners than Absolutely. You know, someone who's just brokering a deal. It's just, you guys are in the trenches day in and day out and you know, you know, where, where you can push and pull on deals and whether it's, you know, more TI or, or how yeah. much you can get in rent bumps or, you know, the hot pockets in town. It's like, Unless you're doing this for 70 hours a week, yeah. it's just hard. You're, the transaction velocity that you're touching versus, you know, the one or two investments that someone might make a year. Uh, it's just, it's an invaluable uh, resource and expertise. So thank Absolutely. you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I like that. The advice, it's just like my accountant. Like I think he's working in my best interest. I'm sharing with him my information so I can make the best decisions financially. 
I would do the same for somebody else looking for advice on their, you know, office space or, and it, I know it goes so much deeper into that. That's like their second biggest expense, right? It's like, you know, that's a huge payment for most people, um, is their rent payment. So that's important. Absolutely. Well, Emily, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your busy schedule to bring me up to speed and everyone else who's tuning in, uh, got a ton of value out of it. Uh, we'll reach out to you in the comments uh, with any further questions or follow-ups and figure out, uh, we'll, we'll actually, why don't you tell us your email if folks want to reach out to you directly, and then we'll put that up on the video too. Sure. It's emily.curry and it's C-U-R-R-I-E at colliers.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Take care. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the week. You too. Bye, Sean.